before I forget. A lot of times I forget. All right, so um, tonight I wanted to really just talk about two things. One is a kind of a brief on industrial controls, and, and it's, I think it's important, especially uh, for you guys, you know, from coming from the instrumentation and control world, um, you kind of have to understand, you know, why why this is important, you know, why why the PLC is important to you and um, and to instrumentation and and to your potential future jobs. And then we'll talk about, you know, basically a real high level introduction as to what a PLC is. So this slide I know is is wordy. Um, but it's kind of the, it's the standard definition. Literally, I can't I took it off of Wikipedia, um, but I liked it because uh, it's really a good definition. Um, and a lot of the terms in here are things that you may have um, seen or heard already in some of your other instrumentation uh, and controls classes. But basically, an industrial control system or an ICS, that's kind of the acronym uh, that's used now for an industrial control system. It's a general term that encompasses several types of control systems and associ associated instrumentation used with the industrial process uh, for use for industrial process control. So it's not just the control, you know, not just the PLC, but it's the associated instrumentation because a PLC is useless without, you know, the information, you know, the inputs coming to it, such as um, discrete devices like push buttons and um, switches and and stuff, or the analog sensors like you know pressures, temperatures, um, flow levels, right? The instrumentation stuff, and used for industrial process control. So the whole idea is we're automating um, we're automating some piece of the of the of the process, be it manufacturing of you know um, you know durable goods, shall we say, right, or food and beverage, or if we're, you know, doing chemical process or, or oil and gas process. Um, control systems can range in size, a uh, few modular uh, panel mounted controllers to very large interconnected and interactive distributed control systems. So if your career um, aspirations, if they take you into the the process, you know, industry such as chemical or oil and gas, then uh, you will interface with a distributed control system. And we'll talk about um, distributed control systems. They're basically larger PLCs. You know, they're capable of handling um, a very, very large, um, you know, amount of control, large, you know, kind of plant-wide control. Um, versus a PLC, which is going to be more local level control. And control systems will receive data and remote sensor, sensors measuring the process variable or PV. Compare that collected data with the desired set points and derive command functions that are used to control a process to the final control element. You also will sometimes will we'll, we'll typically maybe use control um, variable CV versus field final control element. So what that's all it's talking about is, you know, if we're talking about industrial or we're talking about process control, a lot of times we're talking about closed loop control. We're talking about a PID, a pr proportional integral derivative uh, control. So in those situations, let's say we're trying to set a temperature and maintain a temperature in a process. So we would have a set point. Set point would be what is the temperature you want to maintain? We'd have a process variable. That's basically what is what are you measuring? What's the what's the process variable? What you know what is the what is the uh, you know the what is the item that you're actually going to measure to compare against the set point? So if we're you know we have a boiler, let's just take a boiler for for some reason. You know if the boiler has a set point of um, I don't even know what a valid number is. We'll just say 400 degrees. Um, so you have a set point of 400 degrees. You'd have a temperature probe inside of that boiler, and it'd be measuring the temperature. And it would say, you know, either you're under the temperature or you're over the temperature. And the control variable 
would be what is it that we're going to control to regulate that temperature. So in a boiler, you would maybe have a burner, right, to, uh, to heat up the water. So maybe, you know, our control variable is, you know, turn down the gas on the burner. Um, or if we need to heat up the water, then we're going to turn up the gas to heat up the water, right? So real, real simple little feedback control loop there, basically, right? We have a set point, we measure, we compare against a set point, and then we control whatever it is we can control to change that, the, uh, the outcome, basically. The uh, larger systems are usually implemented by supervisor control and data acquisition. Uh, you could also see that as called SCADA systems or DCSs, again, uh, large plant-wide control systems and programmable logic controllers or PLCs, which is obviously what we're gonna do in this class. Um, so as though the SCADA and the PLC systems are scalable down to small systems with few control loops, uh, such systems are extensively used in industries such as chemical, pulp, and paper power. Just like we talked about, um, you know, last week, you know, these things are used in every facet of of, uh, of manufacturing in every industry you can think of. Some additional definitions, if you just want to kind of go look, the uh, the NIST NIST stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, it's a government agency that. Uh, that uh, their, their job is to, um, you know, kind of define standards. Um, they have some good definitions of ICS there too. So um, you can click that link in the, in, and read a little more if you want. But um, long story short, you know, the idea is we're, we're, we have something and we want to control it, right? Um, I posted a video in Canvas, I don't know, if anybody watched it or not, it's a, it was a YouTube video. They just kind of talk about what is industrial automation. But the idea is that you know, we certain jobs or certain things we we can't have a human operator just sit there all day and do these you know like repetitive tasks. That's not really what humans are designed to do. We don't certain things we just don't do very well. Um, so the idea is you know we can automate some of that process. We can either automate parts of the process or we can automate the entire process, it depends. So the only way we can do that is kind of by designing these industrial control systems. So we have, so part of why this is a preface into what is a PLC is, we have to first understand what it is that we're going to control. Because the PLC is just, you know, it, it's, it's the brains of the operation so to speak, but we have to program it and we have to understand what it is that the, the process, you know, how does the process work? You know, what are the inputs that we need to look at? What are the outputs that we're gonna control? Um, so as we kind of go through this class, we're going to spend a lot of time kind of looking at little, you know, examples and, you know, we'll have to kind of figure out, you know, this is what we're asked to do. How do we go about, you know, programming to control what we've been asked to do, All right? So, so this class will, you know, it's it's called the PLC class, um, but it is, it's a bit of an industrial control class too, because, because we're going to kind of, you know, look at, you know, kind of controlling various, uh, you know, various uh, processes, um, you know, sim by simulation, of course, but but it'll have you kind of think, you know, through through the various steps of a process, and then how how do you go about programming the steps in that process? So I found a couple of graphics that kind of so the, the the picture on the right is actually the same picture we used in the um, discussion on the last week. Uh, it was just kind of shown in like, you know, level zero, level one, the Purdue model it was called. Um, and it's just a little bit different picture. I, I like this one a little bit better because it's a little less, um, it was just, you know, a little less busy and just kind of showed, you know, a better representation of, of all of the layers. Picture on the, um, the picture on the, uh, here on the left, 
is kind of another example of kind of this distributed control, right? So, so the idea now is we have, you know, we, we have a large facility or we might have several remote sites and these remote sites will have some kind of piece of equipment and the equipment will be tied to a PLC and the PLC could be tied to another PLC, that same facility, right? There could be some communications between these two systems. Um, and then they could tie back to a uh, kind of a general remote kind of uh, control room or control building or another control facility, you know, hundreds of miles away. This doesn't have to be even in the same plant anymore, thanks to, uh, to the communications we have, you know, modern communications. So this remote, you know, this could be the uh, headquarters in Houston, could be looking at the offshore platforms that are here in the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, kind of all tie back to one central um, control room that kind of looks at everything. Um, so this is what we kind of call SCADA. There, you know, it was a term that we that was thrown out there. You might see SCADA used. Uh, basically, it stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So, um, you know, so basically, basically, you would have kind of one central location that could basically bring in, you know, um, kind of be the supervisory control facility over everything. So it could be in your plant, or it could be through um, multiple, again, remote locations. And then over here on the right, um, you know, this was kind of that, you know, level zero, level one, level two, level three again from that Purdue model. But um, I like this because it kind of showed the pictures, right? So, so this as an instrumentation, you know, um, this you know person has that that looks familiar, right? The blue Rosemont or Emerson device. You know, it's going to be some kind of process instrument, right? Either temperature, pressure, level, or flow, right? And then uh, we have I/O in the field as well, potentially I/O in the field. And then these all kind of come back on some network. If it's the um, you know process instrumentation, now it's on the heart, you know, heart network. So everything talks back on heart and um, can kind of come back to the to the um, controllers, PLC controllers. And then, you know, PLC is kind of gathering all this plant data, plant floor data, and then the program resides in here, which is going to make decisions based on the program, you know, like when whatever conditions are true, you know, turn on whatever outputs. And for the most part, this is how life was for the longest time, was just simple. And then as we got better and better with our technology and these products and our communication and networking technology, we were able to start to bring, you know, we were starting to bring you know, stuff from this level and further up. So now we have, you know, part of a, if you're in the industrial automation space nowadays, um, it's not just understanding how the instrument works and how the IO works and how the PLC works. You got to understand how to, um, how to maintain some servers and how to run a lot of software on servers um, and do a lot of various networking too. So it's a, it's a definite blend of some IT and uh, operational OT technology uh, going on for, um, for, uh, for, for technicians uh, in this space, SCADA technicians. So um, this might be something that you guys have discussed in some of the other classes. It may not be something that you discussed. I don't know, um, but it's very, very, very important at this point to really understand the difference between discrete signals and analog signals. Because as we move into the PLC world and the PLC programming, we really kind of categorize our inputs as either discrete or analog. So discrete signal is simply uh, a binary or an on or off or a being binary, it's either a zero or a one. So in the PLC, you know, the PLC is a, is a uh, is it basically it's an industrial microprocessor. So it's industrial computer and the computer does nothing else other than zeros and ones, um, ons and offs, right? Um, so a binary signal or a Boolean signal 
uh, is also what we're going to call a discrete signal. So these would be um, simply devices that can have only two states. They're either on or they're off. So an example of that would be a switch or a relay coil or a relay contact, light, horn, or a motor. Now, a light, you say, well, we have, you know, light can have a dimmer switch. So we're not going to, you know, that's, that's, we're not kind of doing that. We're just saying, hey, a light is either on or off, just like, you know, when you turn your light switch on at your house, the light is either on or it's off. Um, a motor could also potentially work as a uh, kind of a variable speed. There's variable frequency drives. Um, so in this case, we're going to call a motor a discrete device because it's going to be either on or off. There's going to be no, no, we're not really talking variable frequency drive here at this point. So we're either turning the motor on or we're turning it off. So, um, so you know, ideas of you know discrete again inputs to a PLC it could be a push button, it could be a switch, um, could be um, like if it's a uh, if it's a, a process switch, so I could make a pressure switch or a temperature switch or a level switch, right? So there are, um, you know, there are like, a, you know, there are discrete process instruments, like a, again, like a pressure switch where if it reaches a certain pressure, a contact closes, which is different from a pressure transmitter. Pressure transmitter will actually send you the, um, the pressure value, you know, whereas a pressure switch will only be um, triggered if it reaches a certain pressure set point. All right. So we got, so just kind of make sure you're, you're clear with the uh, discrete versus analog. So analog signals will have a numerical value, right? Um, whereas discrete was just binary zero or one. True, it's, it's a numerical value, but it can only be one of two, zero or one. We talk about a numerical value for analog we're talking about um it's a 16-bit register so um it, it'll have a value um you know uh, that could be up to you know 16 bits in length of uh, you know of a number the um it could be an integer or it could be a real or floating point so if you're not familiar with the terminology there an integer is basically a, a whole number, no decimal point precision, whereas a real or floating point number has a decimal point, has a decimal per, you know precision, decimal point precision behind it. So you know, like two hundred point two six one or whatever, right? Um, at this, so hopefully here you you recognize these two um, signals, either four to twenty milliamp or zero to ten volt DC. Those are by far the two most common um, analog signal um, uh, levels that we we get, you know, in the industrial world. And majority is four to twenty milliamp. Um, there is, of course, zero to ten volt DC used out there, but most of our transmitters, like a pressure transmitter or temperature transmitter level or flow, most of those are going to produce a 4 to 20 milliamp output. So that transmitter, 4 to 20 milliamp signal that the transmitter is putting out is going to actually go in as an input into the PLC. So we can take that transmitter, take the 4 to 20 milliamp signal out of the transmitter and wire it to the PLC analog input card. And we can now get, you know, the temperature value um, in the PLC or the pressure value in the PLC. So we can actually use that now and the PLC is our, you know, in some level of control. Um, so examples of analog devices, of course, the condition, the condition sensors, we just talked about temperatures, levels, pressure, flow, uh, control valves would be an, an example of an analog output. And a digital panel meter could be an example of a analog output. Um, so we can actually send the 4 to 20 milliamp signal out of the PLC as an analog output, in addition to receiving a 4 to 20 milliamp signal as an input. Okay. 
Is that clear? If anybody's got questions on, you know, any of that stuff, just please uh, break in and, and ask along the way. Is this stuff that you kind of covered, the 40, 20 million stuff, I would imagine? I don't know how much, you, maybe that, that's, I don't know about the discrete stuff if you've covered that, but. Yeah, we, we didn't. No, okay. No. Okay. So um, just to kind of, and, and uh, trust me, like I guess we're, we're taking it a little bit slow. Um, we'll have a discussion soon that will actually maybe start to make this make more sense because we'll talk about how we take, you know, a pressure transmitter, you know, how we convert that pressure into a four to 20 milliamp signal with a transmitter, how that four milliamp signal gets sent to the PLC. The PLC in turn has to interpret that four to 20 milliamp signal and it converts it to another number. And then it, get, it gets converted again, like for a fourth time into, you know, a number that we actually understand as a human being. This number that the PLC gets it as is a, it's a number that makes sense to the computer, doesn't make sense to us. So we'll talk about that in more depth. So don't worry, we'll, we'll touch on that. But that's important. It's also very important for you as an instrumentation uh, technician to understand because 420 million signal is what every instrument out there it works uh, on 420 million, basically. So it's important to understand why that is. All right, does this diagram look familiar to you? Have you seen P and ID diagrams at all? I've seen a couple of them. Okay, yeah, good, them. good. So we're not gonna really, we're not gonna really, um, we're not gonna really, you know, use a P and ID diagram. Uh, I'm not gonna, you know, but in this class, but, but I just figured it would be relevant to you um, to see this because those things we just talked about, all those transmitters, you know, are typically shown on this PNID diagram, right? And this one was a good one. I just got this one the other day, actually, from a customer. This was a an older system that they're looking to do some upgrades on. And I liked it because it actually showed the PLC panel sitting right here on the PNID diagram. So they had this kind of, uh, it's like a burner, some kind of heater system. And you see that, so the, you know, the PNID stands for piping and instrumentation diagram. So, um, you know, every all these lines have different, you know, like the little hashed lines, I think are air or pneumatic. Um, the dotted lines or dashed lines are electrical signals, salt lines are, are piping or whatever. I don't remember all the details, but, um, but all these little circles, right, are instruments of some sort. And we can see here on this just from diagram, we got, uh, you know, quite a few instruments getting wired back into the, uh, into the PLC panel. Um, right, we got L, we can kind of tell some of these like the LS, LL, that stands for a level switch, right? The L stands for level, S stands for switch. And the LL probably means low level, typically. Um, there, are, there, there, there are standards on these, but then again, sometimes people don't use the standards. Um, so, but that, we can kind of read that as a level switch, low, like a low level switch, essentially. Um, some of the other things I'm not totally sure about, like UA, UA, um, probably user actuated. This looks like a shutdown alarm. Uh, but anyway, um, whole point of this is that if, you know, we could take this diagram and we can kind of see basically what would be some of the, you know, what would be the inputs coming into the PLC or what are the main inputs from the process, right? All the instruments that are on in this system. So if we had to kind of take this system, and if we had to kind of convert it to a PLC, first, you know, first question that, uh, you know, we would ask is, okay, well, what is it, you know, what are our inputs and what are our outputs to the system? So somebody would have to sit down and look at that. And this drawing would start to really tell us at least, you know, what, what uh, you know, start to kind of tell us what all our inputs and outputs would be into the PLC. I promise you, we're never gonna do anything this complicated in the, in the class, we're not, we're not going, this is, this is a much, very involved system. We're never gonna get this far, but just kind of good to show, um, you know, this diagram to kind of show you, you know, how, how uh, you know, important the PNID diagram is uh, to help figuring out things. So if we're talking industrial control, um, let's just look at a more simpler 
example. And this would be just a, kind of a straightforward tank, right? We're gonna have a, we have a tank here, um, some kind of liquid in the tank. It could be water, it could be something else, but we'll just say it's water. We got a pump, right? And we have our, um, we have a, a level switch and I drew it as the, as the instrument uh, circle and the LSH. So it stands for a level switch and H for high. And then those numbers basically just rep represent the the number of the device. So we you know we give each device a unique number so that we know which one we're going to look for, right? So if, if I say, hey, we got a problem with level switch, you know numbers, you know five, twelve, then you know to go find that instrument out in the field, and that's the guy you want to start troubleshooting. Um, so we, we just it's a unique identifier. That's all. So. In this example, um, we're going to say, "Hey, when the when the operator presses the start button, you know, there's going to be a start push button. The pump is going to turn on, and the pump's just basically going to continue to run until, you know, so the the water is going to fill up in the tank. And whenever it hits this uh, this level switch up here at the top, that's when we're going to tell the tell the uh, pump to turn off. So it's like a float switch. Basically, it's kind of like what you would see in, in your toilet bowl. If you've ever taken the, 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 uh, the top off the tank, there's like a float switch in there, right? So as the water rises above, the float switch literally floats up. And when it floats up, it triggers a, uh, a contact that's inside this switch. So pretty, pretty unsophisticated. Just, it just literally floats up with the liquid. And when the liquid drains, the float switch just falls back down and that contact will open. So how would we do this with relay logic? So it's important to know that, you know, before we had a PLC, we had, uh, we just had to wire this stuff up. We had to just wire it up the hard way. We had push buttons, we had relays, we had all these things um, and a cabinet. So um, basically, you know, we would have some kind of control panel um, and we have a start push button, right? And um, basically I walk up and I press this push button that would um, basically tell the pump to start running. And then I have a signal coming back into this panel from the level switch so that whenever the level switch was triggered, it would actually break the circuit to the pump and basically turn it off. So this is kind of what the relay logic would actually look like. So if I was gonna wire the controls for that, then this is what it looked like. We have, um, we have, and we call it, uh, we call this a ladder diagram or we call it, it's, you know, it's really logic. We also call it a ladder diagram because it looks like a ladder. Um, we have a, we have a rail, right? We have two rails. So this rail L1 is typically kind of the positive or the, you know, if we're using 120 volt AC as our control here, then we would have 120 volt AC, the line side coming in here. And this would be the 120 volt AC neutral on this this line. That way we have a we have a flow, right? We have a, a circuit flow. You know, current would flow potentially through this rung to here and then back, right? So that's how our you know our circuit making our circuit. Another typical control voltage we see a lot in industry is 24 volt DC. So uh, this would be the positive 24 volt DC. This would be the negative 24 volt DC. So again, we have our positive. It would flow across the rail to the negative and complete the circuit. All right, so it's just some of the more basic um, electrical properties there. But the way how we kind of read this is we have, you know, again, we have the rung, we have, the, oh, sorry, we had the rails and we have the rungs. So the first rung, we come to and we label them rung one, rung two. That way we just have a, this is more for us to troubleshoot as well. Um, but uh, so, so power kind of is flowing. Power comes here. It comes to the start push button. Right now the start push button is open. I'm not pressing it. So there's no path across here. So it's kind of like a dead end, right? So then it comes down to this next one. It says, oh, I got a contact here, normal open contact, and it's off this CR1. Well, this is the, this is the relay, and this is the contact from that relay. So we don't have a path here, so therefore this, this relay is not turned on. 
which means that this contact is not turned on. So I don't have a path here either. So dead end, we come down here to rung two. Uh, CR1 again, same relay. This is just contact one, this is contact two. Uh, I come here to this contact, it's open, dead end. So it just kind of, so it just goes, it just keeps going down and down and down, depending on how many rungs are on this circuit. Now, I press the push button. So now there's a path, right? So current comes here. Uh, the push button is now closed. I can, it comes across to the next terminal and it comes down, you know, the rung and it gets to this next device. This next device is the tank level, not high. That's basically our level switch. Well, the level switch is not high. It was the way how this terminology is used, and then this is like drawn as a normally closed switch. I see it's how it's being touched in the other end, is that this will open as the tank level gets to the top. So when when it is high, this opens. But when it's not high, it's closed, which is which is important because we 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 want to be able to pass power across this rung when it's not high so that's why we use what's called a normally closed contact here so we have a normally open push button but a normally closed level switch so once i push this push button button i push push this push button down i got my path up to this point if there's no water in the tank right now then it's not high therefore i've got a path across this contact and now I energize this control relay. And when this control relay energizes, this contact closes and this contact closes because they're both off the same relay. And we now come down to rung two. Now this is closed and now my pump starter will actually turn on. So push the button that picked up and the pump started at the same time. Now I have what's called a seal circuit here, or this is also known as a latch, or a, you know, it's a seal in or a latch circuit. Because the problem with this is that our push button is what's called a, uh, most of our push buttons we use are, are momentary push buttons, meaning that they're, they're spring, they're kind of got it, they're spring loaded in that when I press it, when I take my finger off of it, it opens up again. They're not maintained push buttons, right? So you, you've kind of, you have sure you've pressed the push button before where when you press in on it, it kind of locks in and you press it again and it kind of, you know, kind of pops back out. That'd be a maintained push button. But like a push button like you have on your keyboard is like a momentary push button, right? The minute you take your finger off the, the push button, um, that, you know, on a keyboard, it goes back up again, right? It's got a little kind of spring in it that kind of pushes it back up. Well, that's important here because we use, we pretty much use momentary push buttons throughout most of our um, industrial control applications. Because what would happen is I press this push button down, right? I got my relay picks up and my pump turns on. Well, the minute I take my finger off the push button, this drops out and this therefore drops out and i'm not going to spend my entire day just sitting here holding this push button in just to keep this pump running right that's not very practical um so what we do is we call we, we create what's called a latch circuit so we use this um control relay right here a contact off this control off this control control relay and we actually put it in parallel to the push button. So now when I press the push button, I energize the relay, this contact closes and now the contact closes and now I have this parallel path and keeps its own self energized. So when I take my finger off the push button, I still have a complete circuit going this way in parallel. And the only way for this latch circuit to be broken is for 
the tank level switch to be triggered. Because once this opens, that breaks power to this relay. And then that makes this contact go back open again. Also makes this contact go back open again. That makes the pump stop. So simple, elegant. And this is an incredibly common, common thing that you would see done. You're also going to see this exact same thing done in the PLC. But what the PLC does is everything in this diagram here is hardwired when it's a relay logic. So this is a wire, that's a wire, that's a wire, that's a wire, that's a wire. So it's a lot of wiring here um, to, to do, and therefore it, it becomes a bit of you know troubleshooting as well. If anything goes wrong in here, you know you got devices to figure out, you got wiring to figure out. It becomes a little more complicated. And if it's you know it's never going to be as simple as just this little example, or right? it's going to be a lot more to it than this. So it gets to be more complicated. The advantage of the PLC and the whole reason why the PLC is, uh, you know, is, is why it's so important to us is that it takes this and we can now program this versus hardwiring this. And the advantage of that is if I need to, if I need to change something in here to do it in this relay logic, we mean rewiring things. Or it might mean, you know, having to buy a new push button. Uh, you know, it might mean having to, you know, punch a new hole in the door. It might mean having to, you know, break a bunch of wiring and rewire. It also means you got to take power off of this, right? So there's a lot of work and a lot of, um, you know, just, um, you know, it's a lot of rigmarole, shall we say, in order to um, maybe make some circuit changes to this. But in the PLC, if I want to make any kind of logic change, it's just simply reprogram it, download a new program, and away we go. No wiring, no rewiring required as a result. And hey, if what I programmed didn't quite work the way I wanted it to work, well, just go back to the old program and life is back to normal. You know, here, if I rewired it and then I realized later that, oh, that was dumb, I shouldn't have done that, well, I got to go rewire it all back to the way it was that just takes more time away from you know makes takes more time away um, from the piece of equipment working the other reason why the plc is important is because this is what it used to look like so the the previous diagram was very straightforward right it was just a simple kind of one you know, one little circuit, you know, relay. This is basically relays. All these little black um, bases here are relays. So this panel is a nightmare. Begin to try to even figure out, you know, something, try to troubleshoot something that's in this panel, right? You know, you got a rat's nest of wires, nothing's labeled. You've got, you know, 30 different relays sitting in this panel at least. Um, if you don't have a good set of drawings, you know, can you even begin to troubleshoot this stuff? So it'd be very, very difficult to troubleshoot. So the PLC takes that mess and makes it look like this. So we still have wiring, of course, but what happens now is we're going to bring all these devices to the PLC itself. So this is an actual PLC. This is an Allen Braley Slick 500. It's a little bit of an older PLC, um, but uh, you know, still used today. You, you could still see them uh, in some control panels, perhaps. And uh, what happens is, is each one of these cards. So, so this is a chassis, and then the chassis has so many slots to it. Uh, one slot is the CPU or the brains. And then uh, another slot sometimes could be an, like a communication card, like an ethernet card. And then the other slots are typically IO or inputs and outputs. So you can have this you know, discrete input, discrete output, analog input, analog output. Um, you could have like a thermal couple or an RTD card for temperature sensing. So various cards, um, the bigger the PLC, the more 
options of cards there they have uh, available to them. This this kind of great thing on the side here is a is a power supply. So basically, we have to energize this chassis. So we'll bring power, you know, into the power supply, and that'll feed power to the back plane. Just like your computer, you have to, you know, you have, you have a, a a power supply built into your computer. You put a power cord to it, um, and that energizes the motherboard. That's kind of exactly what happens here uh, in the PLC. The other items in the panel, this is terminal blocks. So this is kind of where you, you kind of your field wiring kind of comes in on terminal blocks. It just kind of helps make the transition, you know, from the wires coming into the panel and, you know, easier, but you can kind of bring them to the terminal block. And then from the terminal block, they kind of fan out to all these devices in the panel. Um, these devices up at the top, these are like relays or contactors. Uh, this looks like some circuit breakers like little switches and kind of isolate and turn off power to, to, to various branch circuits inside this panel. Um, some additional terminal blocks up here looks like, right? So, um, so a lot of times your, you know, your inputs will kind of come and wire in your outputs might go to like, uh, to like these contactors or relays. Um, so the PLC would turn this on and this would switch typically higher higher voltage or higher current devices like that motor, that, that pump, the pump that was gonna fill the tank is gonna be a much higher voltage and take a lot more current than what the PLC can put out. So therefore you, you use a uh, external contactor to switch that higher current. Okay, um, so uh, we understand, you know, there's all this kind of, control on the plant floor and we um you know we're going to bring it into the plc and we're going to program it now versus hardwiring it so but why you know but again why why the plc or uh, what is a plc um basically it's an industrial digital computer and i'll go even further and call it kind of call it the special purpose or single purpose digital computer. It's designed for controlling industrial, you know, industrial control. Um, it's ruggedized, meaning that it's, it can work in the heat, it can work in the cold, and it can work in the vibration that we find in industrial spaces. Um, it's adapted for the control of manufacturing processes. So that's kind of that special purpose uh, computer. It's expandable and scalable. So we can, um, you know, like that system I showed on the previous slide, you know, we, we could uh, we could add more I/O to it if we needed to. We could uh, add a remote I/O drop to it if we needed to. So it's it's very expandable uh, beyond kind of what you just saw in that picture. Um, we could take various signals from the plant floor and devices and instrumentation. So it's again, being that it's meant for industrial manufacturing, it it's designed to take in you know, the plant for devices. Um, I've seen many people say, well, can't we just use like a Raspberry Pi or can't we just use an, an Arduino or something to, uh, to do the same stuff? The answer is yes. But the problem is the Arduino is not designed to take 24 volt DC signals or 120 volt AC input signals or four to 20 milliamp signals. It's designed to take in like a three volt signal. Um, so it's it's designed to be more of like um, electronic duty versus industrial uh, pilot duty, they call that. It, it kind of works in the same manner, but it's just not designed for the industrial world. Um, and there's a lot of communication options to the PLC. So we can talk ethernet, we could talk serial communications, we could talk field bus, which is uh, important in the process world. Um, it's highly, you know, provides high reliability control. So PLCs are very, very, very reliable. Um, another common question is why not just use an industrial, why not just use a computer? Why not, can I just take a Windows 10 laptop or a, a desktop or a tower computer and have that thing run the, the plant floor? Um, it can, the Windows computer could do that. There, there are many, um, what we call um, PC-based control things. It's almost like a PLC, but you just run on a computer instead. 
Um, but the, the biggest problem to that is Windows computers are typically not considered highly reliable. They have gotten better over the years without a doubt, but um, still, how many times is your computer and your laptop just kind of get sluggish at times or you know you got to uh, reboot occasionally um, or god forbid you get the uh, the blue screen of death um, you can't have that on the plant floor you can't have that on your process control you don't want to have your um, you know process control just you know decide today that oh, i gotta go reboot the system right so um plcs have been rock solid highly reliable uh, there's really no operating system on them as far as uh, there's not a Windows operating system on it. So you don't have to worry about Windows going, you know, berserk on it. It's, it's, there is an operating system, but it's embedded and it's something that you can't tamper with. Um, and again, they're just highly reliable um, devices. And they can be programmed in multiple languages. So ladder diagram, uh, function block, which is used a lot in the process world, structured text and sequential function chart. Uh, for purposes of this class, we're gonna really just do ladder diagram. Um, if there's some reason why you wanna maybe look at another one, like maybe function block, we might be able to do that. But typically in this class, we've only done ladder. Ladder diagram is probably the most you know, widely used, um, but function block again is used a lot in DCSs and, um, um, process control. Okay, so types of PLCs. Um, go a few more minutes here and a couple couple of, again, some, some high level uh, stuff. So it's really kind of, if we, you know, if we're going to kind of, we can kind of break or, or, you know, categorize PLCs into maybe three kind of buckets. There's micro nano, and there's a small or, or mid-sized controller, and then there's large controllers. So every manufacturer, there's lots of different manufacturers of PLCs. Allen Braille and Siemens are by far the two largest out there. Uh, GE makes them, Omron, Mitsubishi makes PLCs, uh, GE Emerson. Um, so, you can run into, you know, there's probably 20 different brands of people out there that make a PLC, but predominantly uh, Siemens and Allen Braille are the two largest used ones out there. Allen Braille by far is the, the most used in the United States with the largest market share. Siemens kind of uh, wins out when you go uh, overseas globally. Um, but it doesn't matter who you use, they kind of all have the same kind of kind of portfolio when it comes to these different size um, controllers. So this class will kind of start out with the micro nano. These are small, uh, very inexpensive, uh, small meaning that they have, you know, small number of IO points that they can handle. So maybe a hundred plus or so IO points that it can take in max. It's gonna have you know less memory on board, very limited amount of expansion, limited amount of communications. So you know there's always trade-offs. You know to get to a low low price point, you have to kind of give up certain things. Um, but these are ideal for small individual machine control. Uh, we have these in 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 the lab. And as a matter of fact, what we'll do in this class is each of you will 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 have you borrow one of these, then there's some free software that you can download. So you'll have an actual real controller. You can get the free software from Rockwell's, from Ryan Burley's website, and you'll be able to actually um, program and, and play with this PLC um, at your house. Um, that's That'll be our plan, at least for the first part of this class, um, because we could do a lot, we could do a lot of different things with just this little micro PLC, uh, lots of different programming exercises with it. So this is the exact one we have, the little micro H20. This, so actually all three is what we have uh, in the lab at, at Delgado. So when we come to the small or, you know, sometimes you say small slash midsize, um, the Siemens S7-1200 is an example of that. 
when we say small, we mean it. So now you know, this was like 100 IO. Now we're going to maybe around 1,000 IO points. It's still, it's still got a small amount of memory, you know, uh, some expansion better than what was in the micro nano uh, can handle some remote IO, meaning that the IO doesn't have to be attached. It can actually be remote and connected back um, over a, like an Ethernet cord. Uh, still kind of limited when it comes to communications, but better. And it's going to be a little bit more expensive, of course, now. And these are great for like a system uh, control or machine control. So when you have a you know larger machine or a larger system, this this would be maybe the right platform to use um, to keep your costs low. Um, then you know if we move up to the large uh, you know PLC, now we're looking at you know ten thousand plus. IO points. So when we're talking about distributed control systems, this could be a distributed control system because it can handle a very large amount of IO. Of course, it can't, you know, you can't put 10,000 IO points here in this one single chassis, but you know, it'd be a lot of expansion, you know, a lot of a uh, remote IO connected back to here. But um, you know, large IO points, large memory, very expandable, extensive communication options, and at a very high, you know, much higher cost, right? So there's always trade-offs, right? Cheap means less, you know, middle of the road means I got some more bells and whistles. And then of course, um, you know, the most expensive option will give you, you know, pretty much all the capabilities that are possible. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter which size, which one we're doing, doesn't matter which brand you use, be it GE, Allen Bradley, Siemens, whoever. At this point, every PLC works in the same manner. And it's as straightforward as this. So those are, here's our kind of those two uh, rails um, of, the, uh, of the ladder we saw earlier, right? The L1, the L2 plus the minus. So we're going to have our inputs now wire to the input card on the PLC. So all the piece, all the PLCs will have, you know, various input cards. It could be discrete, like these are discrete, or it could be analog. These inputs will will tie into the logic unit or the CPU of the of the PLC. This is where the program resides. So we're going to, this is, you know, we'll program the logic. We'll put it in here. There'll be, a, you know, mem internal memory to, um, to keep, uh, to, um, uh, you know, to store the program. And, um, and then the, the logic will get solved and then it'll tell the outputs to turn on, right? So, so the inputs come in, we, we write a program, and as a result, we might turn some outputs on. So we could turn on a light, we could turn on some solenoid valves, we turn on a relay or whatever. So we have input circuit, logic, output circuit. Pretty much uh, every PLC is universal in that respect. So kind of a little bit more detailed block diagram of the PLC. We actually have um, kind of multiple pieces here. You got your IO system that we just talked about. You got a power supply that'll kind of give you board level power to power up your processor. Uh, you've got memory and you've got the programming device itself, which is how we're going to interface into the PLC to actually program it. All right. Um, so just a few few more concepts here. Um, so the way how the, the way how the CPU, the processor works, or the CPU, is it actually works just in a continuous cycle. So unlike a like a Windows 10 computer, right? You you would maybe run a program and it would just run the program and it kind of be done. The way how the PLC works is it's going to just continuously run the program over and over and over again. So it's called a sweep. So at the top of the sweep, we kind of read the inputs, we solve the logic, and then we write to the outputs. And we just do that over and over and over again. So 
the, the program is constantly being run. And we're talking about the way how this sweep works is in the order of milliseconds. So we could do this sweep in the order of like, you know, several milliseconds, depending on how big the program is and how much IO we have to write. You know, it, the bigger the program, the more IO, this, this sweep time will definitely increase. Um, you know, it could become larger and larger or longer and longer to, to complete the sweep. Small program, it could be, you know, very fast. So, so the order of milliseconds to, to do this, uh, and it just repeats constantly. So again, uh, IO system, we talked about this already. Um, so this is just a diagram of how these inputs are actually wired to an input card. So we have an input card on the PLC and they're usually labeled like, you know, input 0001. We always, so it's, it's the microprocessor world. They like to start with zero. So you see a lot of PLCs will reference zero as the first input. Um, so this is an eight point input card, but we start with zero and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so this is a, a discrete input card. So we, these are all just various discrete input devices like a push button or a liquid level switch or a valve limit switch or a pressure switch or a flow switch or a temperature switch. So again, discrete, right? Either open or they're closed. So this, this terminal on the PLC receives the voltage signal here. And if it sees the voltage signal here, it basically puts a one in the input register for this input. Because again, the PLC, the CPU doesn't know what 24 volts is or what 120 volt AC is. All it knows is I'm on or I'm off. And if I'm on, it's going to be a one. And if this is off, there, there's no voltage on the screw, then it's a zero. And that's how the input card works. The output card kind of works in opposite, where we're going to write either a one or a zero to the output card. And in turn, it's going to convert that to whatever the voltage is. So in this case, it's a 120 volt AC um, card. So when I put a one, when I write a one to this output, it will now turn on and pass 120 volt AC out of the card and therefore will energize this device, which is a 120 volt AC relay coil. All right. So basically, I can control and turn on each individual output um, individually in the program and basically switch 120 volt AC to all these to each device when that's wired to the output. Um, basically showing the same thing, but just as a, uh, you know, kind of another way to draw it. This is the MicroLogix 1000 PLC, which doesn't really matter or mean anything, but basically you got your input. So a lot of times we, we draw our, our inputs on the left and our outputs on the right, because we're kind of show it as a, you know, input in and output out. So it kind of mimics that relay logic diagram quite a bit. So our inputs are kind of on the left-hand side, they're going into the PLC and they're going to come out um, on the right-hand side. That doesn't mean that this, that, that this input directly correlates to this output but it just kind of has that look and feel of that flow kind of in and out, in and out, in and out. All right, and the memory. So uh, last piece is just that, you know, each PLC manufacturer, each CPU model in the, in the family has a different amount of memory. So um, not something we need to really kind of worry about too much in this class. But if you got out into the real world and started to kind of do program a design of PLC systems, you want to be aware that um, it's not just, hey, I got a S7-1200. There's many different versions of the S7-1200. And each version has different capabilities, right? So there's a 1211C, there's a 1212, the 1214, 15, 17, right? So it's about how much memory. So this one's got 50, 75, 100 kilobytes, right? And if you notice here, we're talking about kilobytes and megabytes, right? You're used to 
gigabytes, right? Your iPhone has, you know, whatever, 64 gigabytes at, you know, possibly even more. Um, in the industrial products, we're not gigabyte world yet. We're still in the megabytes and kilobytes. Um, because we can do, you know, the program we need to do is not that, not that um, memory intensive. So we don't have to put a ton of memory in these devices. So that was the Siemens, our control logics, which is again, was kind of our large size that we are looking at megabytes. So here we cap out at about 40 megabytes as the largest controller option out there. So 40 megabytes. So still pales in comparison to what your iPhone might have, but, uh, but that's a significant amount of memory for, um, for the PLC on the plant floor. So last, uh, last couple slides, just a few more minutes here. Um, and that is just to kind of introduce real quick, kind of the programming aspect of this. So we're going to continue to do ladder diagram, just like we showed earlier. And we're look, looking at basically ands and ors, right? And gates and or gates here. And um, if you did, you know, there's another class from the ELET curriculum that you probably don't have to take or, but digital logic, and they talk about ands and or gates, but it's pretty straightforward when we look at this type of um, ladder diagram. If I'm trying to pass power across this rung, in order to get power to move, you know, from here to here, all the way down there, you kind of look at it in the terms of ands and ors, right? So to get across this rung, I have to have A or PB1 and CR1, right? It has to be this guy has to be on and this guy has to be on in order to get power, you know, up to this point. Uh, but then I have a parallel route here, right? I have another parallel path. So I can look at this as an or, right? So I can have this path or I can have this path, right? So this path is A and B, or I can have C on and I can get power to right here. But then I still have, you know, one more hurdle to get through here. So it would be, and if I was looking at this rung or this you know, top line, it would be A and B. And this has to be um, true as well. Or, or C and D, right? So if you kind of just think about it in ands and ors, if you think about you know, when we start doing some programming exercises, you might have to look at it as, okay, I have to have this on and this on and this on, and then I can turn that on. So you kind of look at it as, as ands and ors, and that just basically translates into, you know, if it's a parallel, parallel branch or if it's a, you know, in series with each other contacts. So looking back at that tank from beginning of the class, um, we can actually take that exact same, uh, relay logic ladder diagram and convert that now into the program. And it's the exact same thing we did. The difference is now um, we actually will have a, an address in the PLC that we will reference is we're going to wire the push button as an input. We're going to wire the tank level not high as an input. So they go into an input register memory space. So we will have a memory space that will say, okay, this contact is tied to this memory space, which is in turn wired back to this push button. This level high is tied to this memory space, which is in turn tied to the level switch that we wired to the PLC. And then we have these O's. The O's will stand for outputs. So this is a pump on light. That would be an actual output. That would be a light that we turn on. The run pump, that's an output. That'll be the contactor you know, that energizes to run the pump. So last slide for tonight would be right here, just to kind of compare those two side by side. So, so this was our, our old fashioned relay logic where we had to wire it all. And this is our, our new way of programming it. So this is in a nutshell is what we're gonna be doing 
is writing programs like this that can kind of take some various control schemes and then turn them into a, a program that we could put into the PLC. Um, and we'll do the best we can to simulate various uh, inputs and outputs uh, based on what we what we can do. All right, so um, that's about it for tonight. Um, anybody has any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, as far as next week goes, um, we'll sort that out. Um, I will be teaching the other class I teach. We'll actually we'll be meeting on campus next week. So um, doing some virtual sessions probably will not work out as far as doing on Monday and Wednesday nights. And I know you guys have another class that lets out earlier, like around, you know, sometime after seven. So stay tuned. We'll figure out um, what we'll do next week. Um, by any chance, is like Tuesday night or Thursday night, y'all have classes on those nights or are y'all open on those nights or how's that? Yeah, we have class on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Okay. We'll sort something out. Don't worry. Uh, oh, one other thing too. Um, if you happen to notice that the, 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 the class time got changed i don't know you might or not even notice that but they made it they, they changed it only because they um you know for me as a teacher they're like you can't have two classes at the same time um and get paid <laughs> so so they, they basically moved the time just to kind of make it tomorrow so i wasn't like teaching two classes at the same time so it doesn't mean we change classes doesn't mean anything it just it's more of just a um an internal thing so if you happen to notice that don't don't get caught up in that nothing changes as far as how we're gonna do this class um anyway well stay tuned i'll think through and we'll figure out a way to uh to keep going there's gonna be you know a few more things i want to talk about before we start to move into actual programming so um um so i want to get through that stuff maybe i'll post some videos we'll see but um we've got some still some foundational stuff to discuss and then we'll cut you loose and start doing some programming uh, in the very near future. Okay. Um, just any questions? If not, we'll close it out for a night that's been plenty and it's late and uh, I'm sure we're all ready to go to bed. So, um, <laughs> or you got homework to do still probably. So um, if you don't have anything else, we'll close it out. Yeah, no questions. No questions. All right, guys. All right, great. Have a good night. All right, you too. You too. All right.